Hello everybody, welcome back. I'm very fortunate to have Dr. Hoffman on a video interview today. Dr. Anthony Hoffman, he's an oncologist out of New York City, the Bronx to be specific. And we're going to be bringing you a series of videos talking about all kinds of things related to oncology. And we're going to really dive deep into this rabbit hole over the next course of uh, several video series. But in this one, I wanted to make it more of a introduction. Who is Dr. Hoffman? There's a lot of other researchers watching. First of all, we're going to explain what a clinical research study actually is. We're going to focus specifically on people interested in oncology, maybe current oncologists that have not done research, or CRAs that want to get into oncology. There's a lot we can learn from you, Dr. Hoffman. So thank you, first of all, for being on today. Hi, Dan. How are you? Good. Thank you. So I appreciate your time. And why don't you give us a little bit of a background? as to who you are, how you got started in medicine, and then let's we'll get into how you got started in clinical research as well. Very good. Um, so the, the passion for clinical medicine started with, in a laboratory of, um, where we studied retrovirology in San Francisco at UCSF. Hmm. Um, with, um, I was working in the lab, lab of... Um, Dr. Jay Levy, who um, was doing work on something called retroviruses, which is um, which are RNA viruses, um, which are well described in all kinds of animals, but not so much in humans. And um, in fact, the retroviruses is where the oncogene um, idea came from. And that was uh, between 1980 and 1985, and during that time, unfortunately, we had the um, HIV started, and we were at the epicenter, and so we ended up uh, studying, uh, we found the HIV, because the HIV has a similar system of uh, replication, which uses an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, and therefore, we were doing those assays already for cells in other systems, and uh, uh, we detected this activity, and uh, that's uh, the story with uh, HIV. But the this process of research uh, in the lab um, is what really motivated me for the rest of for the next thirty years, thirty seven years, to um, ask questions, ask questions about. Uh, um, all the things that we do in medicine and in oncology specifically. Uh, because if you think about it, you know, for many, many years, we had um, um, two or three drugs that we use for uh, several types of cancers. And then over the last uh, 10 years or so, there was this whole armamentarium of um, uh, new medications that have come out, what we call targeted agents. Mm -hmm and biological agents like the monoclonal antibodies, like Herceptin and Avastin, these type of medications. And um, <clears throat> these have enlarged the armament, the toolbox that we use to uh, treat cancer. And each one of these new drugs, uh, um, since we were able to help more people, the more people we help, the more the more it is rewarding to do, uh, to practice oncology, obviously. So we want lots of medications and help as many people as possible, naturally. Mm -hmm. So the, and oncology is a very special place to do research because of the fact that we still don't, we are still not curing everybody, obviously, nowhere close. So the status quo is unacceptable. We need to ask questions and we need to ask um, complex questions and um, try to come up with answers to help real people. So the, the, that has taken on a life of its own when um, the uh, idea of immune, 
of the immune system being involved in uh, the development of cancer and possibly as a, as a uh, way to, um, to treat cancer, um, that um, revamped the whole field of oncology. It gave it a new charge, a new uh, um, enthusiasm and uh, excitement. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, as you know, um, immunotherapy started uh, really with um, in melanoma. And uh, if you talk to doctors who take care of patients with melanoma, they're very, very, very uh, sad doctors because, you know, in the old days, melanoma was basically a, a death sentence. And the fact that you were able with a novel medicine like um, um, your boy um, to basically save a third of the patients affected by this disease. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, uh, President Carter is a former President Carter is an example of such patients who have the, um, actually the melanoma had spread to the brain. And despite that, he was cured by these uh, immunotherapy drugs. Immunotherapy. Immunotherapy drugs, yes. <clears throat> so the since immunotherapy is based on the immune system and it's based on real cells and uh, you have to understand what the different type of cells, the different elements of the um, immune system, how they work. And since retrovirology is basically based on, uh, you know, the immune system is very important in retrovirology because obviously it's not just the function of the virus, but it's also the, the host reaction to the virus which causes the disease state. So one of the retroviruses in one of the mice, for instance, causes a disease very similar to lupus because of the fact that the, um, the, the virus looks a little bit like the kidneys of the, of the mouse, and therefore the mouse starts to attack the, um, some, the kidneys and other organs in, it, in the body. Therefore, the uh, immunotherapy and oncology it be, they become even more um, um, important to somebody like me who at one time was in a laboratory because mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of language, laboratory language, that uh, becomes relevant when we talk about immunotherapy. And what's also very interesting is the fact that as we become, um, we, are we are basically learning about immunotherapy, it's the way I look at it is that we're at the beginning of a long cycle where we're going to be um, expanding lots of therapeutics in this field and even look back and, and see some of the old medications that we use perhaps, say for instance, for high blood pressure and learn that uh, these drugs uh, may have an effect on the immune system. And therefore, maybe we may be able to use in combination um, an antibody, say, and a blood pressure medicine, mm -hmm. or um, um, <clears throat> an antibiotics, perhaps. So the complexity of the immune system, um, the fact that today um, we are able to grow uh, cells or antibodies, any type of biological uh, therapy, or say vaccines, patients on tissue made vaccines, um, they basically, the, the, you, the doctor becomes kind of like the, um, the plumber. He's the, he's the real, as opposed to just prescribing medication, you theoretically could be in a situation where you have lots of tools and for each one of the patients you need to understand what, what is the best combination. Mm -hmm. And now therefore... You Oh, sorry to interrupt. I was just yeah. going to say, you have a private practice, uh, Hoffman Oncology, is that correct? Yeah. And yeah, you're sure. also involved in research. Yes. And I think, and it's one of my theories, it's actually the thesis of my CRO being built on top of, we need, in order to improve clinical research participation for subjects, in order to increase recruitment uh, and retention, we need more research naive physicians to get involved in research. So, wh where do you see that? Uh, 
right now with oncology studies, are you seeing a lack of enrollment, slow enrollment? Uh, absolutely. The, um, <clears throat> for instance, the medical center that's um, in this area, um, in 2015, they were enrolling 10% per year on their studies, um, which is shocking. But it's not far off from the national averages. Um, so 10% you, of capacity or needed, of goals? Yeah. Okay. 10% of what they were expected to enroll. Mm. And, the, and I think that one of the, what you just said is a very important thing, which is um, the research, research in clinical practice is best probably done in a, in, a, in a private setting, in a setting, in a community, not necessarily private, but in a community setting, in a setting where the physician is a caring physician, um, as opposed to a, um, an environment that, that is strictly academic, where mm. the physicians may be caring, but they, um, their involvement perhaps in the lives of the patient is a little bit um, sheltered by nursing staff, uh, uh, residents, and uh, junior staff, and uh, medical assistants. Uh, the attending physician in a clinic spends three to four minutes with the patient, and then the rest of the time is spent with everybody else, uh, the patient navigator, the patient, uh, the phlebotomist, mm -hmm. lots of people spending time with the patient but the doctor. And the doctor is really um, needs to communicate the value of research, you know, the days of of blinded uh, therapeutics is probably. I'm not saying it's over. There's there are still going to be randomized studies, but perhaps there are going to be what we've seen in the recent past, which is drug, effective drug plus or minus research drug, and or for instance, some of these more complicated study designs uh, where you're doing where we are looking for a marker, and then <clears throat> that particular patient gets a specific drug. Um, these uh, mosaic type of studies where you have lots of different options based on the um, attributes of the patient. Um, so basket trials is an example of that, right? Basket, okay. Basket trials. Can you explain that to the... Um, see, so the you have... Um, a whole basket of uh, different op therapeutic options. And um, it will depend on the, for instance, uh, in the example of, um, of the, the example I'm thinking of is lung cancer with different type of th uh, targeted agents for a specific, for specific mutations that are in the lung, that are found in lung cancer patients more often than other patients. So, you know, we have in lung cancer now they have lots of uh, what they call small molecules, which are all tyrosine kinase inhibitors. TKA, and yeah. TKA, yeah. And these medicines affect only, they only work in that mutation. So if you can identify the patient with the mutation, then you can treat the patient with that drug. And uh, that's an example. I hope it's an example of a basket trial. <laughs> okay. We can, we can always edit that. Um, but it, it's the idea of being of being able to try many different things in one patient population. Also, that's another uh, way to do a trial. Is that unique? To, that's unique to oncology, right? Very much so. Yes, very mm -hmm. much so. Because, say, for instance, you have uh, you want to sequence a patient through different drugs. If the patient fought, if the patient prog progresses over study drug one, then you put enroll them into study drug two. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to redesign the study so you can save, um, you know, the idea that we do randomization of thousands of patients where we compare combination A to combination B to only find out that there is a 5% or a 3% statistical significance at a P level of 0 0.01 may be very good for the statisticians and the people who are excited about uh, these kind of studies, but they really have not added a great deal of uh, um, cure rate to, um, you know, just discovering the drugs. In other words, uh, if you take taxo, 
a taxane adriamycin cytoxin. You can have different permutations how you use them. There are definitely re differences uh, whether or not you use them together, one following the other, or two together and then another one. But at the end of the day, these differences are not that it's not zero versus 30%, like for instance, uh, with uh, a checkpoint inhibitor, or say Herceptin, the drug against breast cancer that targets her to new, uh, that was the first biological agent against cancer. Um, that was um, <clears throat> um, uh, the first or second. And uh, that drug, uh, in patients who carry the HER2 mutation, has an activity level of over 70%, hmm. right? So you have, um, you have um, the need to be able to identify only the patients with the mutations. Now, if you need to collect 3,000 of that one mutation, it becomes a very long and expensive process. But if you can test all of them at once, then you cut down on, uh, on the expense. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we hear about all the time is how expensive drugs are. Well, uh, I mean, if the, if the clin just the clinical trials alone, um, you know, if you look at the classical large institutional CROs without mentioning names, you know, their cost per patient is probably um, five to eight times what, it, what the actual cost of running the study is. And on top of that, because of many requirements, first of all, safety concerns, um, and then the concern about having enough statistical power so that you are able to get approval for that indication to sell the drug, you need to end up doing studies with thousands of patients at, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 50, 100, 150 million dollars per study, um, you know, that it adds up, yeah, adds up quickly. It adds up. So, if any oncologist is watching how, and they want to get involved in research, um, what would you recommend? How, how do they start? So, I think that the, a lot of oncology practices shy away from, from research. Um, and Why? Why do they do the, that? They're afraid. They're afraid of expenses. They're afraid of having uh, to impose on themselves more work. Um, the reason why you know, a, some of these large organizations have been have grown so quickly, um, you know, these networks of oncologists, is because they, in many ways, because they, besides handling the back office uh, aspect of the practice, which uh, no doctors today wants to do anymore, you know, everybody has given up on trying to run a business. Um, uh, but besides that, these large networks have the resources to be able to provide, to differentiate the practice, either whether it's research or radiation or uh, the ability to provide complementary uh, treatments or um, um, supportive type of treatments. You know, for instance, uh, I would love to have an acupuncturist in the office. Um, it's not reimbursed and... Uh, it costs money and it's uh, complicated. Um, but the so the, the physicians are scared. They are not familiar with the language that's involved in uh, clinical research. Um, all the different words, CRA, CRO, CMI, SAP, PPD. It's a whole new language. It's and, intimidating. You know, intimidating. So I think that, you know, reaching out, I think that there are people like yourself, for instance, who have understood the needs of all the different players, right? The needs of the physician, the needs of the pharmaceutical, the needs of the sites, and the everybody needs something. Um, and as opposed to one person um, draining the resources, if those resources are spread around, not in a communist type of way, I'm talking more about in a fair way, uh, you spread out according to who's doing all the work, you know? So the physician obviously takes care of the patient. They need to be compensated for the research. 
So reaching out to an organization like yours, for instance, would be a fantastic way to start. Uh, and then being able to, uh, to us, it made all the difference 20 years ago when we brought in-house a person full-time dedicated to getting everything done. So when we started out, we were Study coordinator? A study coordinator, a site management or, mm-hmm. or a coordinator, a CR, you know, she's she was kind of like a little bit of everything. Um, she being a physician, she was she still is, but uh, my wife I'm talking about. Okay. Um, she's a pathologist, and um, after the children, she didn't want to have a five days a week work, so she came and learned all about clinical trials. Took. Um, um, certification from uh, Socra, Socra, and yep. fr- Socra, and uh, I think a couple of other places. I recommend everyone do that. Uh, you need two years of experience prior to taking those those exams. So I know people watching right now on Instagram are interested in that. We have a lot of future CRAs or current CRAs watching, and once this goes on YouTube, a lot of people are going to be uh, interested in um, in following in your wife's footsteps, actually of uh, Starting out as a coordinator, getting certified, and then being promoted to running a clinic, right? And then you can do so many more things after that. It's just people don't understand that you just need to get started because this industry is always in demand, especially oncology. I mean, every year, it's the number one largest indication in all of research by far. And same with the budgets too. It's 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 number one all the time. Hundred percent. I think that the the you know I think this is a very important project to, that you're doing because I think that the more there is no um, there is no um, monopoly in this in in this uh, especially now. I I think that the what we need now is first of all we need to bring a lot of the doctors who have left. Uh, community-based practices to come back um how do we do that patients. and uh, why let's go with why first why well why because i think that the the physicians once they go and become um a 95 nine to five doctor um they lose the um the enthusiasm they lose the intensity the emotion of uh doing medicine and asking questions hmm. So we want we want we want to we want to have doctors that are. I see the doctor as a family member, not as a um, um, a jack in the box. Um, mm-hmm. You know, maybe I'm the only person in the country that sees that way, but You're I know not. patients like it. <laughs> <laughs> You're not. The one thing I recommend, and we have through my consulting company, there's a lot of doctors, and lately a lot of oncologists have been reaching out, um, and. You know, I tell them, well, get started as a sub-investigator first. Okay, right. all the responsibility is on the PI, not you. And you can get, you can dip your toe in the water, and then figure out, hey, it's not that cold after all, and then get deeper into it. And what a lot of PIs, what a lot of physicians don't understand is when they hear of research, they think it's like a full-time job. And yes, it can be a full-time job like it is in your case, right? Although you have a hybrid model where you do research and private practice, uh, Hoffman Oncology, but you you can be as involved as you want to be. It's not, uh, you're not mandated. All all the FDA and GCP mandates is you have safety oversight and PI oversight. Right. Right. I, I, if I remember correctly, when, um, uh, when I started out after I left Memorial, uh, and I, just the first year in practice, the, um, the Lilly pharmaceutical, um, pharmaceuticals sometimes have these, um, um, phase three studies where they're looking at, um, you know, long-term safety or something yep. like that. Yep. And they do it in a way to market, to, to look at, uh, you know, post approval safety um and basically it's um just giving gemcitabine to patients i remember pancreatic cancer patients and um the and collecting the data mm-hmm. it it's not the type of study that is very rewarding but it's um obviously you're using a drug you're familiar with at that time actually gemcitabine had just come out on, onto the market 
and um, <clears throat> you're doing them, um, you get a chance to learn about the forms, how you enter data. Um, you have a monitor that comes every three to four weeks. Um, and therefore, it's not scary. And you get to learn what a coordinator is. Don't be those doctors that take on the entire study and want to do every single ask, including data entry. I know some doctors that do this. They do everything, including data entry, which is like a, depending on what state you're in, 12 to $15 an hour job, right? right. I mean, that, don't do that. You know, you have right. people that are study coordinators. You have research assistants. You even have medical assistants that can do data entry. It's just a matter of training them like you did to bring in a site director and have them help you manage. That way you can do what a physician is supposed to do in a clinical research, which at the end exactly. of the day is safety oversight. Right. And, and the, the, once you, you know, it, 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 the leap from that kind of low level activity to more complicated studies is, is actually pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once you get, you, you are able to overcome that initial, um, timidity, say, um, you want more, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I think every oncologist needs to bring research into their, and I think that the um, it's easy to set up um, small networks of oncologists, like-minded oncologists, even if they are not <clears throat> in the same area, uh, to be able to, because the whole point about studies is to be able to get them done, get them done quickly, and get on with the next study. Um, the sponsor or the CRO loves to be able to get the things done. So, um, you know, there is a point, a break point of size where the network becomes too big and too uh, much like a um, institution. And then it loses the, that element of speed and um, uh, uh, stealth. So um, a small network, a small, a, a small collections of sites in an area, um, as you are doing, Right, you're mm -hmm. doing, you're having certain sites in an area. Um, that's a fantastic way to bring more trials, and you know you can have one of the physicians or rotate. One of the physicians can be in charge of making sure things are getting done. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Now, as we wrap up, and we're gonna, for anyone watching, we're gonna get into so much more in future videos. Uh, we're gonna, I know you're interested in exosomes. We're going to talk more about immunotherapy and Hoffman Oncology will have a blog. Excel Bio has its own blog. A lot of the videos will be featured on both sites, podcast. They'll go on my YouTube channel as well, the ones that I think relate to the audience. Um, we have a lot of people interested in becoming study coordinators, so non-physicians, right? Maybe they're foreign trained physicians or you know, science, science degrees, but no, non-physicians, and they want to get into research, and naturally, they all want to get into oncology, because that's, that's where the biggest money is, that's where the, that's where they pay the highest salaries in research, and, and so, it's also the more, most exciting area right now, most there's exciting. so much going on, yeah, and the most difficult, too, as far as, like, from yeah. a regulatory paperwork perspective, everything, much more difficult, mm -hmm. SAEs, I mean, if you want to talk about oncology studies, the SAEs of a regular study compared to one patient in an oncology study, you can pretty much take all the SAEs from every site of every subject in most trials. That's right. And it will be that's one right. binder in an oncology study. Right? right. Maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not too far. Not too far. Maybe so. We should bring um, my wife to uh, speak one day. Yeah, we'll have her come it. on as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That way we can get the well, perspective nice. from there. But what do you recommend to these researchers that don't have oncology experience uh, but want to get involved? Uh, I I always say start start as a study coordinator. Yeah, study coordinator is a is a good entry level for sure. Um, and um, there are there are plenty places that are hiring. I mean, I. I looked up on Indeed.com and, you know, there is <laughs> so many. They can't fill the jobs. They can't. There's too many jobs. They can't even fill them all. So That's right. What's the, what are the, let's go with a handful of the most important skills that you need to be an oncology coordinator. 
or CRA because they're pretty much the same thing. So what are what are some of the things the, well, the traits? I, I I think that's the the you know you have to be well organized. That's um you that's a skill that some people have and some people don't have. Um, because you, uh, the binders need to be very neat. Um, uh, you need to be able to find the papers. You know, you need to know what's going on. It's not a, it's not something you write on a scrap of paper and then you just put it. You know, um, so organization skills is very important. And also, the doctor relies very much on the coordinator to kind of take care of the patient once. Once the doctor says, you know, we have this study of this medicine, I think it's very important, you should get on it. Then, oh, let me call um, Jennifer over and uh, she'll explain you and give you the consent form. Um, you know, they, there's a lot of delegation. Obviously, you have explained the consent uh, before. Naturally, you've gone through every every page and mm-hmm. uh, in details. But I'm saying um, the actual document, the signature, as it were, um, you've gone through a lot of it very much, but then, you know, you need another person it to go through it again. It falls into the coordinator's lap. Basically, yeah. the majority of the work um, falls into the and coordinator's lap. That's right. And that's CRAs right. too. I mean, poor CRAs yeah. that have to go monitor all these uh, SAEs. Pobrecito. Pobrecito. <laughs> that's good. So they deserve, I think they deserve their pay, their high salary for, in my, no, in my opinion, oncology CRAs don't get paid enough. Uh, you know, what are you, they, what are you seeing the, uh, on average, what is the salary that you're seeing around 150, today? 150 K a year? I think they need to get like 250. There are some that do if you're an independent contractor and you have several different contracts, you can make that much. Um, 300, you're kind of pushing it like your max, at least right now in 2018. But, I think they should get paid a lot more than that. Um, just my opinion. It's just a lot of work, and it takes a certain. I think you need to have. I think you need to be passionate about oncology to some extent because that's what's going to get you through the the grueling tasks that you you have to go through. Is hey, why? Are, what's the bigger picture? Why are you doing this? It has to boil down to some kind of passion that you have. Right. Or just some Absolutely. kind of interest that you have, like in the science or find something. And if that's not the case, don't even do it because you're going to burn yourself out. I see uh, some coordinators really like the interaction with patients also. Mm-hmm. There is a there is that aspect. Uh, they may not be they may not have a nursing background, but they probably should have become a nurse. Yeah. But, but didn't. You know, they have this caring um attitude about them that's it's very nice i mean i you know in some ways while the patient is on the trial a cra can become um, very involved in the care you know with mm-hmm. uh because for instance in our in our office uh the patients have their cell phone number you know and they, they'll they'll call the cra before they call the call me <laughs> right uh they bond uh and it's um it's another member of the team taking care and it it doesn't it, without obviously you don't want to th- now because you have more people less time for the doctor not at all right it's it's more time for the doctor and new time for another person more more proactive time for the doctor more I think proactive. A, a better use of their time so overall more overall more more face time with patients mm-hmm. uh, from the practice point of view and that translates also in, in a way, in a, um, the care is better. The patients know that this is a place where people pay attention. Yep. Because from their experience, they got so much attention, right? It doesn't mean that every patient in the office gets that much attention, but from the patient point of view, if they have to, if, if let's say, for instance, they only came for the trial, They'll walk away from this saying, oh, my goodness, the doctors over there were, everybody was so nice, so caring. We spent hours together. Right. Now I came back to this office, terrible. Mm-hmm. I only see the physician once a month for yes. 20 minutes. And there's a whole group, and we're going to get into this in other interviews because um, there's going to be a lot. There's a whole podcast. Just go to HoffmanOncology.com, uh, Bio. We'll have links underneath this video. Sign up to the email list 
on both and subscribe to the podcast. If you're interested in oncology, there's no content out there um, as far as oncology and clinical research combined. On There's no podcast. There's no YouTube videos. So this is really going to be the first, Dr. Hoffman, that we're going to get into e-patients. These are the, uh, there's a whole movement around e-patients. And they're big on Twitter too. They, they're, these are patients who are either uh, currently battling cancer or mm. uh, survivors. Okay. And they, they, these people are experts in research. I mean, they know mm. the latest studies that are out. They know the latest results the minute they go publish on clinicaltrials.gov. And I think we need more of these patient ambassadors to help and Big Pharma, like Eli Lilly, is paying attention. They're actually engaging some of these patients to help them design their studies for mm. better retention, for better uh, recruitment. And so we can get into some of that as well in future interviews. But I'm just excited about this series that we're about to do. We're going to talk about exosomes, immunotherapy, inefficiencies in oncology studies. Um, but I think this was a good introduction for everyone and a good first episode for Hoffman Oncology, and we'll also feature this on Excel Bio. And one is more patient, patient and physician facing, Hoffman Oncology. Excel Bio is more pharma facing, but there's a lot of overlap. And for those ones, I think I will include the content on both. Um, so Very good. thank you, Dr. Hoffman. I'm looking forward to doing more. Thank you. Too. Thank you so much, Dan. And, and people uh, are going to love this because they love oncology. And I'm I fair, also do love oncology. And I, I would hope so, but yes, you yeah. absolutely do. And stay tuned, everyone, for more. Uh, we're going to have more announcements, um, lots more about oncology, everything you ever wanted to know. Just stick with us. Um, Dan and Dr. Hoffman from Hoffman Oncology, and in this case, Excel Bio as well. Thank you, Dr. Thank Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.